Good evening, everyone. Uh, first thing on the agenda is the approval of prior minutes. Do I have a motion to accept the minutes? Okay, motion, motion by Brad, second? Second. Okay, thank you. All right, um, any further discussion? Okay, if not, we'll do the roll call. We'll start with Paul. Yes. Tom? Two. Jack? Yes. Three. Sharon? Yes. Dennis? Yes. Brett? Yes. Larry? Yes. And I believe that's seven of us. I don't see anybody else. Larry, joining. I'm here. Yes. Okay. And Brian's on. Hi, Larry. Brian, are you going to vote yes for the... Uh, for the minutes? Yep. Okay, so Brian's yes. And who who came on before Brian? I'm sorry. It's Dan. me, Larry. It's Dan. It's Dan. Yep. Oh, Dan. Okay, good. So we have nine, nine, zero, zero. Okay. First on the agenda is Chris Gallagher. Chris, are you on? I'm on, Larry. Okay, all yours, Chris. I believe. You said you could uh, defer item eight to George. Um, yeah, I can. I can touch on it quick, and then if there's any detailed questions, George can pick up the. Sounds details. good. Go ahead. Um, okay, go ahead. So, in 2019, two years ago, we the water department um, was approved for an 11 million dollar bond item. the The wording in that bond, the way that it was written, um, left left the piece out. So, this is a housekeeping item to to clarify the language of how it should have been written two years ago. And this allows us to um, use any premium received upon the sale of the bond to actually pay down the premium. Um, so it's a, really just a housekeeping item from two years ago. Hey, hey uh, Chris, I only ask because this is my item um, at, at the town meeting is, are, were there any implications to the fact that we didn't have it in there for two years? George says no. <laughs> <laughs> trying to unmute. <laughs> That's all right, George. You're shaking your head. It's good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. I. I I'm sorry. I, I couldn't figure out which thing to unmute the thing with. Um, the the um, the the point is is that um, in order to be able to use the premium, this type of uh, of wording was in there. Now, when the school did it, they copied something direct whoever put it in at the time left it out so we want to use the premium unfortunately we're not right up against it to the to, to this moment to, to, to help pay down the uh the, you know the borrowing and everything so but it, it so if we add this we're kind of just going back and correcting it so that we can use that that okay. money thank all you right? all right so so, Chris, this is really a, a technical correction. Correct. Okay. Any further questions for Chris? Okay, Chris, I believe you're good with Article 8. So let's move on to 18. Sure. Article 18. So Article 18 and, and 19 really go hand in hand. Um, back in 2013, 2014, the water department built a new treatment plant down off of Oak Street on Lampson Road. As part of that project, um, there was the Mass Endangered Species Act came into effect where there's a, the, a butterfly down there um, that's, that falls under their jurisdiction. So there are these indigo plants um, that were in the way of where the new treatment plant was gonna go. The department at that time transplanted over 200 of these indigo plants to the open field that's cl over closer towards Gavin's Pond. Um, at the time, we were also supposed to, and, and we're supposed to transfer that land into a conservation restriction. So we're able to do that internally within the town by taking those two, two parcels, one of which is in the town of Foxborough's name, and the other is in the town of Foxborough Water Department's name, and transfer those parcels to the Conservation Commission. 
that'll that'll meet our requirement with uh, mass endangered species, and we'll close out the original permit from 2013. Um, and allow us to can continue to operate down there without without penalty from that organization. Um, so Article 18 is for the the parcel. It's a plus or minus 30 acre parcel, map 47, parcel 87, and that one <clears throat> in its entirety will go from the town of Foxborough to the town of Foxborough Conservation Commission. So that's Article 18. Any questions for Chris? Chris, will mm -hmm. it incur will will it incur any cost for the town? Uh, you know, is Conservation Commission going to have to pick up any maintenance or anything like that? The Water Department will continue to maintain the property. Um, so that that butterfly habitat, which I'm told is the only one in the state, um, will the Water Department mm -hmm. will continue to maintain that. Um, the big thing is to make sure those indigo plants are are alive and well. Um, there are some large pine trees that we're going to do some cutting of um, that really hinder the growth of those plants. So we're going to do some land clearing down there in order to, to let those indigo plants thrive. <clears throat> thrive. Um, but that'll, may, that'll stay with the water department. Okay. Chris, I have a question as to the location. There's two parcels here that total 30 some odd acres. And uh, the uh, and it's described as Oak Street, but in reality, it sounds like it's all backland. It's north of the treatment plant. Is that correct? Yes. So oh, you, Sharon. Yeah. So if you um, the the piece that's the town of Foxborough property um, runs from Oak Street, um, abuts goes towards Sharon, abutting the Atherton Road properties runs all the way out if you know where the to the Sharon town line just short of Gavin's Pond Road. Yes. yes. That's that's a 30 acre parcel. That's the bigger piece that's getting transferred. And then the the other piece um we we are actually subdividing the other parcel. Um so the other article 19 is the piece that's in the water department's name and that's map 48 parcel 9. That in its entirety is a 61, almost a 62 acre parcel. We're gonna split that off. So there'll be a parcel A, which will be 4.1 <laughs> acres. And that that will um, encompass along with the water, the other parcel, the butterfly habitat. So the, the resulting parcel uh, fronts on uh... Oak Street from Lampson Road north for several hundred yards. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So those are the those are the two parcels. Um, we're working with I'm working with Planning Board to split those other the Water Department parcel. There's an A and R plan and and process that goes through the Planning Board um, to actually split that parcel. And at the end of the day. It's going to stay as is. Um, they'll stay in, they'll go to Conservation Commission's name. The town of Foxborough Water Department will continue to maintain the habitat area for the butterflies. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's about it. Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with this. It's, it's quite interesting. Is this a butterfly habitat, uh, an official park open to the public, or you know, what's its designation? So it, as it stands right now, um, the piece that falls into the water department um, is really protected under the, the DEP's requirement um, in our zone one and, and zone two restrictions, um, really the zone one around the wells. Um, but it's, it, once they transfer to conservation, it's, it's available to walk. You can actually come in from the top of, top of Lamson Road. There's actually a path in the cul-de-sac from Austin Lane. And then the, if anybody knows where the soccer fields are over on the Sharon side um, off of Gavin's Pond Road, you can actually come in the backside as well and walk along the edge of Gavin's Pond Road and get to this area. I, um, I, I actually walked that area uh, this weekend and someone put signs up all over the place, save the, the frosted elephant. So it's definitely a topic in Sharon that they're working on. We have- 
We have one or two residents that are very interested in the property out there and actually have done a lot of cutting of, of brush on their own. And then the water department staff will go out over there with a smaller truck and load up and, and get rid of the, some of the brush. Chris, did you say that people can't go there until the land is actually transferred? No, they, they can go there now. The, the big thing for, for the water department is to make sure people are staying away from the wells and the treatment plant itself. Um, you know, the treatment plant, that building is fenced off. The well buildings are not. Um, some of the construction that we're doing down there now, we will end up putting fences around the well buildings. And the big thing for people to realize is that that's, you know, anything that hits the ground there eventually leaches down into the aquifer, which is where the wells are. So anything, you know, the big thing for us is, and it's frustrating for the water department because it is signed, um, you know, official uh, you know, water department staff only, um, that people go walking with their dogs down there and they don't think twice about not picking up after them. So if I'm on, if I'm on a platform and, I, and I've got <laughs> people watching, the biggest thing is that's your drinking water. So, and that's everybody, all 6,000 of 17,000 residents in Fox Road. That's, you know, one of our resources for our drinking water. So, you know, if you're down there, you know, clean up after yourself. That's the biggest thing I can say um, for, ev for everybody's benefit. Thank you. Any further questions for Article 18 or 19? No. Chris, I think you're good. Let's move um, on to on. Article 21. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, this is an annual article we have. This is for the sewer district revision. Doesn't always come up, um, but every, every so often, every, really every, almost every year, we have somebody come up that's interested in getting into the sewer district in Foxborough. Um, the district was set up a number of years ago when, when Fox Road joined the sewer district with Mansfield and Norton. Um, it was a way for um, the town to have input as to where the sewer ended up within, within the borders of Foxborough. So this, this particular property is 96 and 98 Mechanic Street. Um, it's the Lantern Court uh, Condo Association. It's directly across from the Ahern entrance on Mechanic Street. So there are two buildings. There are 14 units total on that <clears throat> property. Uh, they, they have come forward. Uh, one or two of the residents have come forward interested in, in connecting the property to sewer. Um, they would be responsible if, if they decided to connect um, to actually put all the pipework in the ground. Um, the, the closest connection is actually over in the Ahern parking lot. There's a chest, the Chestnut Town Homes Association off of Chestnut Street has a sewer lift station that they operate, the Ahern School is tied into. Um, that's the closest connection point for them. So there's a couple of people that have come forward in the association um, to, to take some of those steps, find out you know, information, what the closest connection point would be, how they could make that connection, what the costs are associated with it. Um, they haven't moved forward with a formal application, but this would allow them to do so if <clears throat> the association chose to, to move forward and connect to sewer. Hey, Chris, so Chris, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask Chris a general question. So do properties need to be added to the sewer district before any applications can happen? So this would have to uh, be the case for every resident who wants to get on the sewer? So there's, there is an area around the, the uptown area, um, around the common that is, um, is separated out as already being in the sewer district. Um, okay. And then, you know, what, what they, what the town did, and this was just before I got here, I think it was 2013 was when they did this. They took all the properties that were already connected and they put them in the sewer district. I there think, are some, okay. some ex exceptions. Um, if the sewer is available and somebody has a failed septic system um, and the sewer is right there in front of their house, that's the desired connection point instead of them putting a new septic in the ground. Um, so that's one way. It's an it's an exception. Um, the other things that we've we've seen come up are, you know, if it's a 40B property, um, again, we can't we can't deny a 40B project. Um, the state doesn't allow us. So, but every everybody else, you have to get put into the sewer district before you move forward with a connection. Okay. Thank you. 
So Chris, I, I take it we have we have plenty of capacity to for now, for the time being, to to add properties to it. We do. Yeah, we we have a lot of capacity left in the system. We we gained when we when the plant expansion was done, we gained uh-huh. 170,000 gallons a day. Um, you know, the the larger properties, you know, the, a 250 unit apartment building is going to use about 30 to 35,000 gallons a day. Okay. Um, so we have and we haven't touched that 170,000 yet. So we there's a lot of capacity left in the system. Chris, when, when a property joins like this and, and they have a number of units and, and existing septic systems, do you have to decommission it or do anything with the town to certify that it's kind of uh, gone or, or removed or does it just stick in the ground for forever long? You no, know? nope, that falls under the Board of Health. Anything anything Title V related, septic or cesspool related falls under the Board of Health. So they would have to decommission that. Um, they would pump, pump any holding tanks out. They would have to crush it, then fill it with sand. Um, and then bury it. Okay, any further questions on Article 21? Chris, I think we're good. All right. Thank you for coming in. Um, I'm sure the, the people, the, um, the owners of those articles, if they have any questions, they'll give you a call. Definitely. But, but we're good. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, have a good night. Paige is next, but I don't, oh, yeah, she's on. Hi. But, uh, hi, hi, Paige. Hello. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Go may, ahead, I, may I do my brief slideshow as an overview of- um, Absolutely, my, absolutely. Okay. Just because I have a lot of, you know, detail. One of my uh, bylaws is very long and I'll explain yeah. why, and then we can get into the Q&A after. So I'm gonna- So, so you know, um, I did forward your press your, your presentation to everyone. Okay, so I'll whip through it quickly for the for the viewing public. <laughs> okay. All right, let me see how to do the share screen. Getting good at this. Okay, now let me see if I can make this a slideshow. There we go. Does that look good for you guys? Yes. Okay, good. Um, So Article 22, if you read it, is um, actually kind of something we have no choice on. Um, This is the floodplain bylaw. It's meant to protect, you know, life and limb from property damage and whatnot from flooding. Um, The federal government is involved in this through FEMA, and they run the National Floodplain Insurance Program. they, the state of Massachusetts has agreed with to work with FEMA um, to sort of act as the representative for FEMA, on FEMA's behalf in Massachusetts. And so the, the state of Massachusetts has come out with a, um, ma- a mandatory model bylaw for us to pass. Um, so this article would be basically replacing in its entirety the current floodplain bylaw with the model bylaw um, slightly tailored for Foxborough, like we didn't have certain districts, so we were lab- able to eliminate um, references to those districts. But generally speaking, this is a mandatory requirement, and all the language was given to us. Um, if we don't choose to pass this bylaw, then the residents won't be eligible for the floodplain insurance program. So obviously, that's a non starter. And just um, I added on this slide the name of the woman who was actually wonderful. Um, I sent her our bylaw, and she basically tweaked it for us. And I probably sent back about 10 or 15 times different um, iterations because we, you know, we, we, we vet this through a lot of departments and she was wonderful. So um, this was all done through coordination with the state. So I'll get into Q&A after on this, if anybody has any. Then article, the next article is 23. This is um, also sort of a housekeeping matter. Um, We're basically seeking to replace the map showing the current Baker Street Historic District. Um, I've worked with the Historic District, Baker Street Historic District Commission on this, and they've signed off on this. What this is, is just merely correcting something that's wrong. The current map in the bylaw is a very poor quality. And this is an example of it right here. Um, it's That's what it literally looks like on paper. It's just a photocopy. And the reference um, in the bylaw is to 1999, and yet the plan date is 2004. So we've, we're never really sure how this all happened. Um, with the current proposal, 
on the, in the new map, um, we haven't changed anything. The lines are exactly the same. It's just a much prettier picture. And we're making sure that the language of the bylaw matches the language of the map so that there's no question that everything um, is very clear. So um, again, there's no change to the boundary and the Historic District Commission has signed off on this. Um, Article 24, another correction. Um, Gabby Jordan in my office, she's a, my fellow planner. Um, she one day, a few months ago, noticed that in the bylaw, it listed currently, let me go down to this one. Um, it shows the old version on the top there, that table shows what it used to say. Um, there. And then all of a sudden, Gabby was looking at the bylaw for some reason, and it jumped out at her that assisted living, nursing homes, and whatnot had Ys next to them um, and brought it to my attention immediately. And we started digging, and we haven't fully figured out what happened. And we all agreed it doesn't really matter at this point. I think the most important thing is to put the bylaw back to where it was. Um, the reason being is if you look at the Ys, that means yes. And that means in the zone, in the use table, if anybody wanted to come in and put in a nursing home or an assisted living facility anywhere in town, um, in your neighborhood, basically, it would be a by right use. Um, so we, so this is not okay. Um, we need to fix this right away. So that's the current uh, proposal is to put this back to special permit, which is what it always was prior to codification. And at some point, something changed in the bylaw, and we're not sure why. Um, so this is to fix something that's wrong. Um, and yeah, so to be clear, we're proposing going back to special permits for all districts and then to an N, no, for S1. And we did relook at S1 and question why it said no and um, came to the conclusion that it had to do with um, pretty much emergency services and having vulnerable populations up on the other side of Route 1 during game days or concerts. And I think generally speaking, it was just agreed that for right now, that's not necessarily something we're looking to change. And we thought this would be cleaner to just keep it to the way it was before the inadvertent apparent change uh, rather than getting into the debating the uses. Lastly, um, this is just a, a sort of a standard operating procedure. This Congdon Way um, is being proposed to be accepted. It was appro uh, proposed and approved by the planning board with the intention of be being accepted by the town. Um, that's the standard way subdivisions work. It was built to all the standards of the town. Um, and it, um, let me put a little map there. So just to show you, the map's not showing up so well, but Stop and Shop is down at the bottom for reference. And this is up off North Strait, off Lawton Lane. Um, so um, this is a standard procedure. We've had to been doing inspections, inspections throughout. And then um, Chris Gallagher will give us a final recommendation at town meeting as to whether all the final punch list items were done, such as uh, street sweeping and making sure the catch basins are cleaned out. We do that at the very last minute so to make sure the town's getting a, you know, a, a quote unquote perfect road up to the last minute. Um, so, but the planning board is, is supportive of this and has actually put this article on the warrant. So um, we are suggesting that you prove this. And that was my whip through of my articles and I'm glad to entertain questions as needed. Hey, Paige, why is only half the Doolittle home in the historic district? I believe that's because um, the half that's not in it is the newer section. And it was a deliberate um, decision made at some point, because that was one of the ways we realized we were doing a map. You know, well, as we were vetting the new map, one of the versions that came through showed all of the Doolittle. And um, that was just a GIS error. So we had, that was brought to our attention and we went back to that way. So I I wasn't around then, but I think it's because it was an old, it's the newer section, not the history. Thank you. Go ahead, Tom. I, I actually noticed, noted that same thing. I didn't know you could actually cut a building in half. Is there actually a divider in that building from the new to the old that is separate? I'm not certain. Okay. Again, this is how it is now. Okay. I, I don't really know. Um, so our, our bylaws don't have anything also to preclude us splitting a building in two to make part of it historical and have part of it not. So. I don't think so. I mean, right. obviously we got it through before um, we've had it this way, so I. <laughs> okay, uh, secondarily on uh, the uh, Article 22, the floodplain. Yes. <clears throat> I know in my discussions with Chris talking about the dam project on West Street, 
that, that may affect the floodplain in that area. Will this have to be redone again after that project is done? Or is this already taking that into account that uh, if GIS has done anything in regards to that? Um, well, I don't think it will change this bylaw itself. Okay. What it could do, I guess, someday is if FEMA or whomever does these um, flood elevation maps, you know, perhaps if that changed, they would figure that out and change it. But um, I'm not sure. Oh, here's Chris. Thank goodness. <laughs> I'm winging it here. <laughs> I'm still listening. Oh, good. Um, so what they do is every every 10 years or so, the federal government actually comes out with revised plans. They're called firm plans. Um, and that's that's when people get an opportunity to look at the maps. They send them to every town um, that that's affected by it. And we are, we're all able to take a look at them, see if we agree with them. If we don't, we're able to send in revisions. Um, you know, this, the, the project on West street will have minimal impacts on that. Um, nothing that, that would affect this bylaw. Um, it's really would be the maps that are attached to the bylaw, which come from the federal government every, you know, like I said, every 10 years or so. Oh, okay, thank you. Question? You just, oh, sorry, Wait, go ahead. Who did you say? Go ahead, Jack. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I have a question on the floodplain article. Um, the uh, uh, on, in the section on requirements, um, a developer is required to provide base flood elevation data for subdivision proposals greater than 50 lots or five acres. Do we have examples in town where you've got 50 lots on less than five acres today? I don't think so. I mean, you know, it, it struck me when I read this that that 50 lots should probably be 20 or something like that because if you look at why the, uh, these are there, you go to the first part and it, and, and it talks about the purpose and it's things like eliminate new ha hazards for emergency response officials and it's one of six uh, uh, things there. Uh, it's not clear to me that we should um, stick with the 50 uh, that might be appropriate for Boston or Cambridge. Uh, it, um, it's not necessarily true for here. And it should be a smaller number. Maybe. Honestly, Jack, I, I don't think we should mess around with it. I mean, I do think if you look specifically, it talks about within unnumbered A zone. So that's a very specific area that maybe Chris can elaborate on what that even means. But I think that's that. Like, I think that's a floodplain. Um, I guess we could ask. I just feel very hesitant to tinker with a bylaw that's been pretty much, uh, you know, been reviewed 10 times over by the state. I mean, and I also know that anything in a floodplain and all our engineering reviews for a subdivision of any size, we look at this, we look at flood data and we don't allow development in floodplain and whatnot. So I would just say that I don't think this it has as many teeth as you think it might have for this one provision. I, uh, you know, I think whenever a subdivision is reviewed, like I say, whether it's five lots or two lots, we look at the drainage and we look at right. um, the elevations. And Chris, I don't know if you can elaborate better, but. No, I, I agree with you on that page. Um, you know, they're not allowed to build in the floodplain. Um, the big thing is that they're showing the floodplain on the plan. <clears throat> Um, they're showing what those levels are, what the elevation of that floodplain is. And then, you know, they actually take the, the firm map and overlay it onto the design plans to confirm that they're, whether it's roadway, whether it's a house foundation, whatever it happens to be is outside of that floodplain. Um, you know, I've, I've only seen it happen once that somebody overstepped and overreached this, the side yard in the subdivision in one, in one lot. Um, and they were actually they were made to do floodplain compensation um, in place of that because they'd already put the foundation in the ground and, and the house is up going vertical. Um, and that's, you know, almost 20 years. Everything else is usually caught up front. Um, the big thing with this bylaw and, and, you know, I spent some time with it as well as, as Lance, the town engineer, is the process of, of the town. So when, when a permit comes in, this bylaw is really talking about who gets notified, how do they get notified? Um, and really it's the record keeping afterwards to make sure that 
everybody who's who is supposed to see this these plans that that are close to the floodplain or that meet this bylaw are seeing that that plan and are having a chance to review the, the documents i think the purpose of this um clause is to require the developer to show that uh, with um, elevation data that they're not in uh, the floodplain zone. So that's just the reverse. I can certainly ask Joy at the state whether you know there's any harm in lowering these numbers. I just don't understand fully what the implications would be to doing that. So that's why I'm hesitant to say it's not a big deal just in case it is. Jack, do you have any further questions on 22? No, that was the um, um, uh, the major one that I had because that when, when I read through it, and it's and I I have to tell you it's uh, not really wonderful reading. I, I, I don't know how much time you <laughs> spent on it, but uh, uh, it's uh, um, in in general it's 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 needed. Um, but I'm looking at it, and and as I read it, I I quickly recognized that that was uh, just a um, um, a slightly modified version of a model bylaw that the uh, that the state had put out. So it didn't. You know, it, by the time I was in the second page, I could see that. But then, as I read through it, uh, that one section was what came, which um, uh, 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 attracted my attention. Other than that, I, I don't see a problem with it. Okay, thank you, Dennis. I you go ahead, Dennis. Hi. Right. <clears throat> yeah, Paige uh, on the Baker. Historical district. I was just curious: Are there any special requirements or advantages to people uh, that reside in that district? Um, well, they get the benefit of knowing that the homes around them won't change, you know, materially. <laughs> I, I think it's probably your perspective. I think some people probably love living in a historic district, and some people probably would prefer not. So, um, I think it's a personal preference. But there are some restrictions. Um, I've read the bylaw a bit. I'm not, you know, I don't work with it a lot, so I'm not overly familiar, but I think it has some protections, but it's not the most stringent in, in the state. So it's kind of middle ground. But, um, you know, I did walk down Baker Street today and I could tell you that the homes are quite lovely in that district. So um, I certainly, it looks beautiful. Yeah, it's one of my favorite uh, walking places. So I was just curious. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Okay, I think we're done with Article 22. Any questions on Article 23? Brett, that's your article. Do you want it? Do you have any questions? No, I do not. You know, I'm following. If I come up with something, I'm sure I could reach out to Paige, but thank you. Okay. Article 24. Tom, are you all set? You're still on mute, Tom. Yep, okay. I'm off. Um, no, I, it, it's just uh, basic housekeeping, as you said. We're trying to revert it back to where, where you should be. So there's no okay. questions about that. Article 25, that's a hard one, Brad. Do you have any questions? I do not again. <laughs> Does any questions <laughs> on the page? I'm just kidding on, on the hard part. <laughs> that's awesome. yeah, that's right. awesome. Okay, Paige, I think Thank we're you. all set for now. Good. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. Next on the agenda is Article 26. That's a citizen's petition. I, Shelby, are you, are you on? You know what? I don't see her, so we might just move on. Hey, uh, John Mahoney. Well, can I, we can we do a, a quick discussion here, Larry? Because I actually yes. have a. A few questions I think should be probably broadcast to the broader audience, um, and yeah, specifically while I have Bill Keegan uh, available. Um, you know, I, as reading through Article 26, um, you know, uh, the, the first question I have is, um, you know, 
Oh, I think that's Shelby, isn't it? There she is. All right, I'll let her go then. All right, hold on. <laughs> no reason to ask my questions twice. I will right, we'll wait. Hi, Shelby. Welcome to Adcom. I believe you're the citizen petitioner for Article 26. So can you introduce yourself to Adcom and then the floor is yours. I think she's still connecting to audio. We yeah, might, I think I might think, have yeah, to well, wait a second. Yeah, I, I, I saw that, that thing moving around. So. Hey, John Mahoney, good yeah, question hi, for you. Um, yes. Were you able to, did you vote on the minutes? Or I, I tuned in at 7.05, so I missed the minutes. So you missed it, I, that's fine. So, so that's not a big deal. So you and Bernard are both members that abstain. That's fine. Yeah, that's correct, Larry. Okay. Now Shelby is still trying to connect, so we'll wait. She might need to hit a button. If she can hear us, uh, I think she's not. Shelby, if you can hear us, you can take off mute. There you go. There you go. There you go. <clears throat> Hi, Shelby. Well, welcome to Adcom. I believe you are here to talk about Article 26. So before you start, can you introduce yourself to Adcom? Yes. Um... I'm sorry, if you can just give me one minute. I'm, Absolutely. I, I do Take apologize. Time. Take your time. We are ahead of schedule, so go ahead. Okay. Take your time. <laughs> I actually had another meeting playing in the background, and I, I didn't understand why I was hearing a different meeting, so I do okay. apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> so good evening, everybody. My name is Shelby Kornbluth. Um, I have been working with a group of um, other Foxborough uh, residents to um, propose a warrant for uh, the town meeting this year. And the purpose of our warrant is for a change in the capital improvement um, process, um, the, the, the way that that, that gets funded. Um, and so I'll just kind of... Um, I'll give you a little bit of a background and then I'll go into the changes that we want. So um, right now, the, uh, the capital, the CIP committee, the Capital Improvement Planning Committee is a committee that consists of the um, town manager, the school superintendent, um, a member of the board of selectmen and a member of the advisory committee. And then there's one other member and from the bylaws, sometimes it's difficult to understand who that is, whether it's the director of public works, the head of water and sewer, but right now it's the director of public works. Um, and so the um, so a group of us got together and we're looking at how um, that is um, done today. And we realized that um, the director of public works, the um, town manager and the school superintendent all proposed the budgets for capital improvements. And we thought that it was a slight conflict of interest to have the people who are proposing these budgets to be the ones who are making the recommendations for the budgets um, to the advisory committee and to eventually the town meeting. And so um, we thought that it would be better if it were all um, residents or voting uh, voting residents in the town of Foxborough who would be part of this committee. And I think that um, this committee traditionally has been, you know, especially this year has been fairly um, fiscally responsible, but we never know what's going to happen in the future. Um, you know, and, and we really just want to protect ourselves going forward in the future to make sure that the actual residents of the town of Foxborough are the ones who are making the recommendations to the Board of Selectmen and to ADCOM and eventually to the um, all of the voters in Foxborough at town meeting um, and to, to get that good representation um, during, during that process. Um, and like I said, it seems to have been working in the past and, and we're not saying that it's not working today. What we're saying is that we just wanna protect our future. You know, we wanna make sure that that committee maintains its fiscal responsibility and, um, and is really Rec making recommendations that the voters in the town of Foxborough want. Um, the other, the last thing I'm going to say about that is, um, you know, the um, typically when what comes out of that committee from 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 my observations for the past couple of years, and and I have to be fully transparent with you all. 
when my kids were young, I really was not involved. I was not paying attention. But now that my kids are in middle school and high school, I have more time on my hands. So I am able to pay attention. Um, and now that I'm paying attention to all of these things, you know, it, it's, you know, it's, it's become, um, you know, a, I'm just, I'm paying more attention and we just want to make sure that um, it's going forward. But like I said, now that I'm paying attention to these things, we realize that what this committee recommends is typically what is agreed upon when it goes forward to um, advisory committee and as well as the town meeting. So I know that in the past there have been um, some challenges to that, but for the most part, I think that overall most people vote um, yes as to, to whatever this committee recommends. So we're just trying to make sure that that committee is fully representative of town residents and taxpayers so that they can um, so that we, we can get the best recommendations for the town going forward. Dan, do you want to do you want to ask your questions before I do? Yeah, please. Um, they're they're a little different than the ones that. Uh, go that go you ahead. Asked, go go ahead. Ask your questions. Email. Yeah. Go okay. Ahead. Cool. Um, so I just first question, Shelby. Um, I am making a big assumption here, but uh, did somebody help you write this article? Yeah, there were a couple of us involved. Okay. All right. Um, were was anyone um involved in uh the tap not Foxborough necessarily, but um, you know, any laws related to the town? Was anybody a lawyer? I guess my question is no. there are some things I really like, and there are some things that I kind of look at and they give me pause. Like, so for example, I like the fact that um you'd be recommending a, a capital improvement, you know, program for the following five years. So that would be helpful in terms of, oh, we want to buy, you know, three police cars this year, two the next year, two the next year, setting that up. I, I think that's good. Um, but um, one thing I noticed was no appropriation shall be voted for a capital improvement requested by an officer department board committee or commission at any town meeting unless the proposed capital improvement is first submitted to, reviewed by, and voted by the committee. I'm not sure, and I want to talk to Bill about this, I'm not sure you can do that. I can't, I'm can't. i not sure you can prohibit town voters from voting on something at town meeting. You, you, see, what I'm, you see what I'm saying? Right, so I think... So I think, you know, Bill probably knows more about that because he knows the workings of the town. But I, the intent of that was to make sure that um, everything did get submitted to in the budget process at town, you know, in the planning process. You know, this is a warrant. And, and just as like any warrant had to be submitted by February 15th, it had to be it had to go through the process. So it's 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 really just the same thing. It has to go through the proper channels before someone can just say, hey, we want to, you know, we, we want this new thing in town. Right. And I'm 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 not um, disagreeing with the thought behind it. I'm just not sure legally you can prohibit town voters for from proposing something at town meeting. You, you see what I'm saying? I'm just, I, no, I do. I'm I do. Thinking, and, and, and I'm thinking that maybe you want to have somebody review this okay. that has a little background in this, just to make sure we don't put ourselves in a position where, you know, we're not voting on this closer to town meeting because, oh, well, you can't do that. I think you have plenty of time to make sure that this is uh, put together correctly. And I just want to make that recommendation now because, again, I'm not I'm not sure you can. Right. Um, okay. So Chan, that would. I can I think I can address that question no, for Dan. You, so, uh, so, so good evening, everyone, and, and uh, good to see you again, Shelby. Um, so, this is the, uh, the with respect to the question, Dan. Uh, the the current actually version of the language of the bylaw says it has the same identical language. So that's not a change to the language that's being proposed. And the reason that language is included is, is so that the so that the committee itself has the ability to at least evaluate and vet. The the, uh, the need of, of the item before and determine if in fact there's a there's a there's a an ability to pay for it uh, prior to it being submitted to to the uh, legislative body, which in fact is okay. Meeting. So that's in the current yeah. language for the. CID. That's exactly right. So that's not a okay. change. All right. uh, so okay. So just and and it is viable to do it that way. And in fact, it's recommended that you do it that way, so that uh, you don't end up in, in with items coming from before town meeting that have not been considered or, or evaluated for. 
uh, first, you know, whether or not it's it's a viable thing to purchase or whether it, and, and the need is appropriate. And and three is, is whether can the town can afford it. Okay. Okay. All right, cool. Well, okay. Shelby, you don't have to research that one. All right. Um, so I, I only had one other thing that kind of caught my, well, there's two other things, but one one's uh, just a nitpicky thing. And, um, but the other one is, um, you know, you have in here, all members shall comply with the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 26, 2068A Conflict of Interest Law. But my understanding is that if this article passes the way you propose, you wouldn't necessarily need that statement in there, right? I mean, that statement might be necessary if, um, you know, you know, whatever, I'm not pushing any agenda, but I did know that the um, Board of Selectmen proposed an alternate where it's kind of a hybrid of both your ideas. Then that sentence might fit in there a little more aptly, I would say. But if this gets uh, accepted the way you propose, there shouldn't be any conflict of interest because there will be no one holding any part-time or full-time work in in the, the town, right? So, so there there actually could be somebody that does have um, part-time or full-time work in the town if as long if they are recommended to the board, they they could be. But Shelby, if, if I read if I read correctly the the article, it says you was those five members are not allowed to work for the town. So are you saying you, yeah. you're, you're amending the position? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Okay, so, when, I, when I was looking at the article, I believe mm -hmm. it said the five people appointed by the water sewer, board of selectmen, et cetera. Mm -hmm. No uh, member shall hold right. any other full-time or part-time right. office or employment in the town government. I guess, I guess, look, again, it's a nitpicky thing, just something to think about, um, you know, Again, I think it. I, I don't think that it's not a necessary statement if we go in a different direction. I do think it's a little unnecessary if if no one on the committee can hold a town office or employment, then there shouldn't be any conflict of interest, regardless. I guess is I guess is my point. Right. Can, and I, can, I, can I just speak to that? That because I think the con there's a there's a that's being usefully used as a conflict of interest and. The term conflict of interest is a very specific law that speaks to the reasons why, that that things so just because you all hold a position in town doesn't mean you have a conflict of interest. You have to have a vested financial interest in the issue itself. So, in other words, you, I could say if somebody was going to buy something that was going to be directly for the personal use of an individual, yes, I would say that's a conflict of interest. Or if, in fact, there is something that's approved to tell me that that affects. The 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 uh, the personal wealth of an individual. That's a conflict of interest. These items, first of all, are not recommended by, not put forth by the town manager or the, the school superintendent. Contrary to what some people may think, they they're only recommended to. And uh, in fact, I don't think I put anything forward. In um, in I think the only the only project I ever put forward was the town hall, and um, and so the, beyond that, that was obviously for the town. It wasn't for me. So that's not a conflict of interest. So I think the, the issue, you have to be careful about the use of that term because that, that's a specific term of law that has to be, that's really well defined. And if you don't fit in fully with that, it's really not a conflict of interest. So any, anything that the committee does is not really a conflict of interest that I've seen uh, and since I've actually taken the training, et cetera. So I just wanted to make sure everybody's, sure everybody's aware of that. Okay. Um, so one final question I have, um, and this is kind of, I guess for Larry, really. Um, the member who technic the member of the school committee who technically proposes their budget is that the same member that sits on the CIP committee? Oh, well, I, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bill. You 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 can answer. Yeah. So so I, I can you say it one more time, Dan? I didn't catch all of that. So is the person who proposes the budget for the school the school budget? Is that mm -hmm. the same person that sits on the CIP committee? So, for example, I go, I speak to Bill Yukno when we when we did the process. 
but is he actually the worst the person who proposes the school budget or is that the school committee who votes on it yeah ultimately so what happens is they bill uh, and uh, amy work on the budget just as i do and, and george work on the budget for the town and we present it to the selectmen ultimately the selectmen are the ones that recommend the budget to you all for consideration and ultimately for, for, for the you know, in your action at town meeting so i think what, what has to be clarified is that the, the, the committee that the the cip committee only vets the the information as is brought forward by individuals individual departments looking for for approval and, and funding um it then gets is i and i heard shelby heard this the other night so i hate to i'm sorry to repeat this to you That's but okay. it's really it's important for the committee to hear this mm -hmm is that it gets it does get vetted it gets recommended and you're going to see that recommendation come forward next week to the board of selectmen because it you know, because it's 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 I'm a, I have, I'm obligated under the town charter to present a, a CIP plan including a 5 year plan so that that does that's already in there so uh, the, the the recommendation however comes out that came up comes out of the committee because that's a better way of doing it than just me recommending it individually so um and the charter says that, that I'm obligated to do it but there's also the bylaw that says that we should actually have a committee to do it. And so they've sort of been melded together over the years. And so I don't think, I, I, you know, I'm fine with that because I think more um, uh, five heads are better than one in terms of trying to present something forward to uh, to a committee. It, get, it gets submitted to the committee. Uh, I guess reviewed it at, 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 at CIP, then gets submitted to the selectmen, then it gets submitted, submitted to the ADCOM. And then ultimately the, the, the town meeting is, is the body that votes on these things. Now it is true, it is absolutely true that there are a lot of things that get changed in the plan once it's submitted to town meeting. And there's, a, and there's a reason for that because that's the reason why your committee is in, in place, meaning the advisory committee, and, well, and that's why the elected board of selectmen is in place to help make those decisions for the community and to help them in, in, trying, to, in trying to vet those things before they get before the legislative body. So there's a, there's a process for that and that's, that's why it's laid out the way it is. My role is actually very limited, as it is right now. It's 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 just to 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 help coordinate the meeting as, it, as we did this last Saturday, and to actually um, and to try and find a way to to present items that are, that are affordable and and responsible. And, and I appreciate Shelby making that point. We all want to be responsible. That's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happening here is that we have we have done that. I think there's been in some, and I heard this recently that there was. Maybe a need for for more uh, uh, resident particip participation on the committee. I don't think anybody objects to that. I think the, the I think the concern is that throwing the baby out with the bathwater in this case, and that the process that we have now in place does work really well because all the people on that committee know what's what how the town operates, and they also know what the true needs of the community are, as opposed to having five people will come in once a year and look at that those situations and not know. How they truly operate so that that's the challenge and that's that's really the the way it, it has worked well and and quite honestly it's worked well i think the, the reason why i think everybody's is sort of a little bit of a head scratcher for us is that what's the problem with the system and how it's working nobody's pointed that out to me yet and i, I haven't heard it from anyone what's broken with the system why break a system that's already working really well and so that's yeah. i think that's the question and and just you know and you know, I'll, I'll stop there. I just, uh, those are just the points that I think have been raised to me, at least when I've heard from people. Uh, yeah, I, I, and I, you know, thank you, Bill. I, I guess, I guess I kind of misstated my question then. I, I guess my, where I was going with that was, um, you know, if say, for example, the school committee was the one proposing the, the budget, right. Then, you know, Bill Yukna could still be on the committee. I, I guess what I was what I was getting at was the language there. I'm not sure if it covers um, what the perceived not conflict of interest, but you know, along those lines would be. Um, so, for example, you know, um, the Board of Water and Sewer Commissioners are appointing one member. Um, you know, I was more speaking to to Shelby's point of you know, ensuring that there's that kind of separation of church and state. So I guess, I, you know. And and I, just to follow up on that. So I, I think that just to be perfectly clear, um, especially this year, the town has been fiscally responsible. You know, I've, I've, I started watching these meetings last year. I watched them all this year. I think that this year they were much more, they were very fiscally responsible. Um, and, 
And so I, I do want to say that 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 did happen. However, um, the super schools and the finance director for the schools work together to put that budget together. And then the superintendent of schools vote has is a voting member. But it, it, it ultimately, the finance person ultimately works for the school department. It is her budget. It is the superintendent's budget. So she is putting that forward. The same thing with the Department of Public Works, right? The Department of Public Works is putting together a budget, but ultimately everyone for the town reports up into bill. So it, it's, it's still ultimately his, you know, Bill's overall budget. And I know that we have to, we, every, that the, I know that we go to town meeting and I understand that we vote on this at town meeting, but the people at town meeting are relying on our recommendations. And so we just want to make sure that the recommendations that are being put forward are being put forward by the members of the town. You know, if, if it is a, if it, if, if there is an issue with, the people of the town who are on this, who would be on this committee, not fully understanding what's a priority for the town. That is that are the that's the up to the departments in the town. That's their responsibility to let us know what's important and what's not important. You know, and and that's their job. You know, they need to to let us know so that so that this committee can go forward and make those recommendations going forward. Because you know. It doesn't happen every year, but many, many, many times we go to town meeting and everyone just agrees with the recommendations. Um, I know two years ago that was not the case, but other than that, it seems to have been the case. So Don't we be, really want to make sure that that it's it's done this that it's done with the town in mind. I'm Tell sorry. Me, if, if I may add, I generally generally I, I support every citizen's right to uh, to bring any, any article you want to the town meeting. My looking at this, this article, my, my concern is that, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I know I know Bill clarified the conflict of interest, but this, let's just use the word conflict of your concern about conflict of interest. If you let the school committee and the water, water and sewer board appoint a person to represent them, that person, he or she is still going to, you know, pretty much advocating for, for the school committee and the, and the, and the water and the and the Department of Public Works. So I'm I'm all, all I'm saying is that the people appointed by the respective appointing committee, whatever you want to call it, they are going to represent the the the, the interests of, of that area. So that's no different than than anybody else advocating for their own position. So that's that's my my concern right now. And my my second concern is that I, I see what you're saying. You know, right now, you know, you we have two. Um, well, basically three town employees work on, on the committee out of five. Are you are you open to, you know, what maybe adding more town voters to the committee? That people that do not work that do not work for the town. Keep keep so, the existing structure, add more people to it. So I think having the the people who work for the town as part of the process is critically important, right? Agreed. They, you know, you know, um, the Department of Public Works they know what equipment is 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 being is broken. They understand which what what equipment is in for service more than others, and what's a what's a higher need. And and they were able to do that even on Saturday. They, they were mm -hmm. able to express their concerns when somebody wanted one thing over another. You know, they said, "Oh well, this is actually more important to me." So because it, it will help us, um, it will help us more in the shorter term. And so those types of things are are, are very important. But I think that overall, it's still up to the, the residents of the town to be making those recommendations, you know, going forward. And so I think that just adding two more members to a committee, to a five person committee may not be the ultimate solution. Um, so, you know, I, I can go back and talk to the rest of my group. I, I have had a couple of conversations with people, but I have not been able to get to everybody um, to talk to them about this. But I think that um, if there are, I, I just think that if you're working for the town and you're voting on your own budget, it's, it, it, it to me, it, it just seems counterintuitive, you know, like I, I've never been able to vote for my budget, you know, I mean, that, that's not what happens. Um, that, that's not what happens in the real world. And, and it's, you know, everybody, I mean, the, the way 
I understand my budget process and you know you, you ask for everything you hope for everything you fight for everything you can get and 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 that's kind of the way it is and you know people do do you know comp make compromises to to do what's best overall but I still think you know you could always have those some people that come in and, and really want to um who who really aren't interested in, in that um I don't think that's like that right now but I think it, it could be think things always change uh, Shelby, I, I, I want to make a statement, and then I know that a lot of people mm -hmm. wait, wait, waiting to ask questions. So I, I see you, Dennis. I see you, Jack. Um, Shelby, I, 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 know, I know what you're saying, but my, this is my, my take. If the school, people appointed by the school committee and the water department are going to vote pretty much for what those, to, to represent those areas. And then the second comment I want to make is that if we, if this article is passed, we need we the town needs to go and find five willing and able citizens to serve on this committee. You may have some people that are willing to serve, but they might not understand everything else because it's it's fairly complex. It can be, or you can have someone who is able to do it but not willing to serve. So I, I just want to put it out there that um, I, I understand what you, you what what you're doing, and believe me, you 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 have some valid points. You have some good points. I'm just asking the questions from, I guess, from a logistic point of view. How feasible is it? And my my question to you was seriously to, you know, would it work if, if we add a few more people to it? But I've, I've, I've heard your response. So I'm going to hand it off to Jack since I, Jack, go ahead and ask the question. Uh, um, uh, we will in, um, in the, at the annual town meeting in article four, um, uh, present to the voters, um, the, um, uh, the input from also two dozen departments, um, perhaps $75 million all prepared by uh, people who work for the town, vetted by several groups, uh, the town manager who, who uh, is also works for the town, the advisory committee who do not, the board of selectmen who are elected, the school committee who are elected, and by the way, the school committee's budget um, does not get, uh, is not under uh, Bill's formal authority. They have significant independence. Um, so uh, not, not that that matters, but I, I would, I'm looking at the current process. If we are dissatisfied with the capital budget being proposed by um, starting, initiated and formulated by employees, um, that's $75 million. Um, and, and the capital budget is, um, is a small thing in comparison. It's effectively another department. Right. And, and so we're not saying that we're dissatisfied with the budgets that are being proposed, but the, but the expense side of the budget, uh, th this group painstakingly goes through that in, 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 like, you go through an excruciating D get that information. And then your group makes a recommendation. The CIP, that, that detail of, of that review is done by the CIP committee and then it gets presented to you. And I, and I will fully admit, I have not seen how it gets presented to you, but I, I can't imagine that you're going to do another five hour meeting like there was this or, or four hour meeting like there was this past week and going through every single line item of that budget. So my point is, is that your group really goes through the expense budget line by line by line. And, and we all know that the biggest part of that budget is, is really salaries and, and contracts and things like that. This other group, the CIP is going through that, but is going through the proposal line by line by line to make that recommendation. So I actually think of it as really the adcom of, of for capital. That, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it's a much smaller scale considering the size of the, of the budget, but that's how I really see this. <laughs> We, we, uh, uh, we, by the way, have seen the proposed items that are on the capital budget that are proposed yep. for the Capital Improvement Committee. We, um, but uh, uh, we're, not, we're not, well, we, we have only one vote on weeding down the total list down to what, what the uh, committee actually proposes. 
And, and I mean, and you guys do so much as it is. I, I can't imagine you having like all of you having to to be to go through that detail on on the capital budget. I understand that you've seen it, but then you see what gets recommended at the end, right? Well, did we we okay? I'll I'll take a step back. We saw the initial uh, request. That's about whatever five million dollars. What what Jack is talking about? Mm -hmm. The CIP, CIP committee last Saturday voted, and I don't want to go in details, but roughly it was cut free cash down to six hundred and fifty thousand. So the rest, I'm I'm not counting the one paid by ambulance receipts or Chapter ninety, but strictly on free cash, it was down to six hundred and fifty thousand. But I believe was, the five million was everything. The original correct, five million correct. was everything. Yes, correct. I believe if you if you put in the ambulance and the chapter ninety, it's maybe about two two and a half million. Don't okay. if if I'm wrong, Bill, jump in. But so it's been cut by half, Jack. I just didn't want to yeah. present yeah, it because yeah. it has to go to the board of selectmen, the, the, and then the, it'll come to Edcom next week. The budget being recommended, uh, and you'll see it uh, next Tuesday, so there's no surprise here, is one point five million dollars. Yeah. That includes chapter ninety includes the 650,000 of free cash to be used for really critical needs at this yeah. point. Um, and then the other, uh, because we, we, we took a very, very conservative approach this year, uh, given the fact that we, we know that, you know, things are, things are lean, but you know, there were asked to, the town still has to operate. And I think that's the reason why yeah. we took the, the steps that we did. And, it, but, and I but, think also it doesn't include mm -hmm. the, um, the state funding for the West street, um, it does. That, that, it does. That, that, that 1.5 does include the 650,000, which is the chapter 90 money, which is, which all, which all, by the way, uh, $208,000 of that has to come out of chapter 90 to pay for the 708,000 plus the 708,000. Right. But I think the, the original 5 million included the 708,000. That's correct. That yeah. is correct. Yeah, and that, and that money is already a grant that we brought. Yep. No, so, I just wanted to make that point. That's yeah. all. Yeah, fair yeah. Enough. Thank you. Hey, Larry. That that is go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'll go to Brian. Yeah. So, uh, you know, to me, I, I've worked in the public sector and the private sector, and this is not in any way an unusual process. You know, department heads submit their capital requests. It has to go to a committee who prioritize those requests. And a lot of times, the people on the committee are part of the organization, and they've been appointed to this committee. And their job is actually to prioritize, and make the tough decisions. And there will be people on that committee that really are advocating for things from the, for their area of responsibility or their department. But they have to, their advocacy has to pass muster with the rest of the committee members. So at the end of the day, everyone has to give a little ground and you end up with a really good capital, yeah. uh, capital uh, committee list that then goes to the selectmen, then goes to the advisory committee. In terms of conflict of interest, the only time a conflict of interest comes into play in that kind of a process is if someone personally on that committee benefits from something that's before the committee. That person has to declare their conflict and they may, may not have to be recused from the vote and recused from the meeting. So that's where the personal conflict of interest comes in. In my experience, public private, that's generally how it works and it works well typically. So just a follow up statement on the conflict of interest. I understand that there are very specific conflict of interest laws. Um, I'm, I'm not specifically talking about people who have a conflict of interest as defined um, by the by the laws or, or like that. It's more that, you know, departments. Any department is going to want to prioritize their items over another department because it's things that, that they specifically need. And there is a conflict there. And now, you know, I thought that this weekend's process ran well, um, but you, like I said, it's running well now. You never know what's gonna happen in the future. You never know if you get a bad egg in there, right? And, and so we're just really trying to protect that. And so, you know, there are some, you might, you might get somebody in there who's gonna want to convince everybody that they're, their piece of capital is is the most important thing when in reality other things are, are a higher priority and so we're just trying to make sure that that doesn't happen <clears throat> well there's a I, lot I, of it, checks and balances uh, <clears throat> built built into that not happening but i've, I've already said what i had to say uh, if, if i could know mr chairman that 
just in regards to that last, probably the best example of that, of the checks and balances and in, in how that works, is that the police chief, I think, forward, uh, put forward a third or fourth cruiser a couple of years ago. And that went, made it through the capital process, made it through the, made it through the, um, the selectman's uh, recommendation, and then made it to the ADCOM. And I, I think there was, uh, the ADCOM said, decided that it was not something that they wanted to recommend at the time. So, and then, and that's the recommendation that went forward to Tommy. And so then it was defeated. The, the chief still made his case before the committee. And then later on, it was added because, you know, it was turned out, it turned out that the need, that the need was still there. So I think the, the, the reality is that even though people do advocate, and that's, and really the, 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 the re way it's designed the way it is, is because the people that sit on the committee are the most knowledgeable. I think Dennis pointed this out, are the most knowledgeable about the, 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 the needs of the operations per se. And that's the reason why they serve in that capacity. But again, it's only a recommendation, not a final decision with regards to how things are actually decided. Chris Gallagher probably gave away most of his stuff on Saturday. He didn't, he didn't, I don't think he got anything or virtually anything other than what they came out of the state aid. So I, I mean, so even though he served on the committee, he didn't have, he advocated for everything he could try and get, but at the end of the day, he didn't get a lot of that. So I, I just think it's, it's important to really note those things for, for the, for everyone to hear. So, sorry, Mr. Chairman. That's okay. Brian, do you have any questions, Brian? Yeah, Larry. Uh, so Shelby, uh, I think there's a lot of merit to the article. Um, specifically the annual report and some of the additional language, which I think was put in here. Um, I think, so what I'm seeing here though, is there's a lot of complexity in the article. And I think uh, Dan will work on writing up and summarizing it uh, so that uh, it won't be as complex for the, for the voters. Uh, my, my experience in town meeting is, is articles that are this long really confuse the voting public, right? So that's, mm -hmm. That's just a comment. Uh, and then I wanted to ask Bill, um, you know, Bill, is there any reason why uh, having additional um, representation from the town on the committee uh, would prevent us from doing town business? Like I, I'm trying to get, I, I've, I've heard a lot of debate here on this article tonight, but I'm trying to get to uh, what happens uh, if we do this, does it does it affect anything materially? Like, the, the the probably the 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 answer is if, if you add a couple of members, to Apple add a couple of residents to the committee. I don't think anybody would object to that. Um, okay. I think I think the issue is disassembling the entire process and, and putting just just residents on the committee who don't have any you know day to day knowledge of the operation, so they can then recommend stuff you know, knowledgeably recommend things to, to everyone else to, for consideration and for, and for expenditure. I think the, the reason why they put the town manager on the committee is because ultimately I'm in charge of the resp the, uh, the finances for the town. The, the school committee is on it because it's, it's, it's the biggest segment of the, of the entire uh, town's budget. Uh, so, and, and clearly is responsible for the biggest segment of, of employees as well. And so there's clearly, there's reason for that. And, and I think it's important to have those people participate in that process. And by the way, I, I meant to mention this earlier, I'm required by the town's charter to submit the plan. I'm required to. Not, not anyone else in the town is required to but me. It says, that, it says right in the charter that I'm required to, to submit one annually to the Board of Selectmen. So irrespective of the process that we have, irrespective of, of the bylaw that's being proposed, I still have to submit a plan. So, and so that's so. I I think the process that's being proposed, if you if it were if you didn't throw the baby out of the bathwater, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But I think the the problem the way it's set up now, it does work. But I would be, certainly would welcome, you know, input from the, from residents. So we don't, you know, so there isn't any kind of concerns about what's being. I think what what Shelby's trying to get to, and I and I appreciate her concern. I'm not. You know, this is good debate. I I don't have any concern about having these kind of conversations because it's not, not, it's not personal. It's not, it's just, that I'm trying to advocate for what I, how I see this, the process currently working. So, and yeah. I see, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Larry and Dan. I just wanted to make one correction. Um, a member of the school committee is not currently on the CIP. It's the superintendent right. who's on the correct. CIP. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. So I just wanted to make that one clarification. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, so I just, just have a quick question, um, Mike. Has kind of for the group, but more towards Bill. What's best case and worst case here? 
<laughs> so best case is, is that the group operates, the, the newly formed community operates exactly the same as the old one. There's no issues with moving capital projects uh, through through the, the committee, right? So so what's the worst case here? That that nothing gets moved? I kind of find that, I kind of find that hard to believe, right? Uh, it, that things come to a standstill because the new members don't understand what needs to happen. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm trying to weigh this out in a way that makes sense, right? So what, what would be the, the worst case here? Oh, it's, it's a fair question. So I think that the, the only response I can provide to you is that, um, is, is what I, I've said repeatedly, is that the, the people that serve in the committee are the most knowledgeable about the, the, the requests that are coming forward. And so if you put five individuals in the committee that, that don't have any involvement in town government on a day-to-day -day basis and, and, and ultimately show up you know, once, and this meeting only occurs once a year, sometimes twice, depending upon the situation, you're going to be in a position where they're not. They're going to have to get up to speed as to how this, why this, the, the presentation is going to take longer. They're going to. They're going to take. There's going to be a lot more. Uh, I, I say. I would say misunderstanding of how things actually work because they're not involved in it on a day to day basis, and it, and it could actually drag the process out to the point. And things could get recommended. They're not really. They won't really should shouldn't be recommended uh, because for for operational purposes. I think if what I'm, what's unclear to me is why this is really coming forward because it doesn't make any sense to me so far nobody's done identified a single instance where the, where the capital process hasn't worked i've yet to see one nobody's made a recommendation that nobody's identified one so i don't i'm not sure why this is being proposed other than the fact that that you know i've heard that yeah that man the tom angel doesn't live in town and the school superintendent doesn't live in town but the other three people do and by the way um you know, we're, we're, we're high professionals. So our job is to make sure that the town runs as well as we possibly can run it for the benefit of the community. That's and we're hired by the elected officials of the town for that purpose. So. Oh, Shelby, you know, I Shelby, mean, oh, sorry. Shelby, I, I just want to say, I'm, I'm, like I said, I, I support what you're doing. I'm just not so right now to completely change the structure. I can definitely see adding two more town voters to the committee to to make you know it's prob probably not not the right term but maybe to even the arts I I, I, I don't mean it in, in a bad way but to to completely dismantle the um, the uh, committee right now I just don't 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 see a, a need for it at, at this point in time. Right. So the in, so just so everyone's clear, the intent is not to dismantle the committee. The intent is to take a couple of voting members and make them make them part of the committee, but non-voting members, and replace the and then add to vote to additional townspeople from voting members. Agreed. And 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 so then the other thing is that. So it's not adding five people who don't know anything about this. Three people are already on there who know who know about it. it you know, or right now it's, it's there's already somebody from Adcom on there. There's already someone from the Board of Selectmen on there, and this is adding a member of the school committee on there. So those three people automatically n understand a more or 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 are more educated about the process and more educated about what's going on in town. And then you add two other members. I would, I mean, personally. If, if there were more people from Adcom, I think that'd be great because I think all of you have a really good understanding of what's going on. Um, but that's that's a huge commitment for all of you. You already make such a big commitment as it is. So I don't think it's fair to ask that. Um, but I think that it's it's in everyone's talking about things haven't gone. You know, there's nothing wrong with the process. But we've had instances in the past where things have kind of gone awry a little bit, and we just want to protect ourselves for the future. And you know, times right now things are really tight for people. You know, a lot of people, um, you know, like even like town revenue is down. Everyone else's revenue is down, and I think that people are just really concerned that if things continue to trend this way, to make sure that we have a little bit more control over the process. Jack? Yeah, um, uh, one of the lines in the proposal uh, struck me. Um, and in, if I look at the advisory committee, um, what we are required to do 
every article that comes before town meeting, we are required to um, vote and submit a recommendation to the town meeting. Um, the, propo the proposal for a capital improvement committee, if I read this correctly, um, uh, if, if an organization within the town makes a proposal, they can make the proposal to the, uh, this new CIP. If the CIP chooses not to vote on it, but just to ignore it, then it's automatically blocked. And somehow the, that needs to be- exempted. Right, Jack, that's, that's what I was trying to get to. You're, you're right. And I'm not saying it's not wrong. I'm just saying, I don't think it's written right for that. So just to be abundantly clear, this article is taken word for word from, from the, what's already in place today with the exception of who the members are. Everything else is in the existing bylaws today. So that is already in the existing bylaws. Sorry, but that's not accurate. It's not accurate to say that because it's not written that way. There are there are there are other changes, and I think the the term uh, conflict of interest in, interest was included in there. That's not in there. Um, if you read the actual bylaw right now, it's, it's just it's, the it's, first paragraph, Bill. That first and, paragraph is new. Okay. So, but, but I, my point to you is that. That that process was de designed to uh, to uh, change change it several years a couple of years ago, and the same arguments that were being discussed then are being discussed now. What, what is the pro What's the issue with the current system? And you, you made a statement a few minutes ago. You said there were, there were problems identified. I've been here for seven or eight years now. I've not seen one yet where it's been identified as a problem. So I'm not sure where that, those problems have been identified. I, Bill, I think we brought this up at the last time. I don't know if it was with the last time meeting, if it was in a conversation I had with one of the Board of Selectmen, so I mm -hmm. do apologize. But prior mm -hmm. to you getting here, you know, things kind of kind of got a, I don't think people were very happy with how things were working prior to your arrival for that that a couple of year period there. And, yeah, and Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, but that piece would be up for town interpretation anyway, right? So, I mean, you know, if, if this were to get to town meeting and, and get a vote, then people can decide how they feel about that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, qu question on my side. Let's say that we were able to look at the past five years in the process, meaning we got every department's original request for CIP how it was reviewed, but more importantly, the gap between what was requested by department and the outcome. Meaning, let's say for example, department requested, I'll just give a number, $200,000 worth of CIP submitted of what they would need. And understand how it was reviewed, not so much who voted for what, but let's say that we ended up to have 150,000, so 50,000 less. So two things. First, understanding if by shortening that department by 50,000, did that result in an efficiency or something wasn't done? Or if the full amount was, let's say, allocated and, and voted for, was it fair? Meaning, I, I think like everything else, the, the, the benchmarking and understanding numbers are everything. So. From every department, if we could have, if we go back the past five years, look at everyone, what, who requested how much, and what was the end result. But more importantly, given the end result, what happened? I'll be more specific. Last year, the water and sewer department requested a million dollar of basically capital improvement. If I recall very well, it was voted favorably in less than 10 minutes at town hall. That was a big number. Now, we all have an appreciation of how water is important, but the point I'm trying to make, a million dollars to a million dollar. Now, it was presented effectively and very well. But again, myself, I was, again, greatly appreciate of, of that, the fact that a million dollar was approved, but it took basically less than 10 minutes to have been approved. I'll tell you, any other department who presented less than 10% of that number were scrutinized to the max 
So what I'm trying to say is that I have been in Arkham for a long time and I have seen it both ways. Sometimes you have a mix of, let's say, opinions in the process and, and judgment. And I always tend to be very careful about opinion and judgment because I'm all about data and facts. So I think that if we were to look at the past five years and who submitted by why every department and the outcome in terms of how it worked or something failed, perhaps would help all of us, especially if there was something that was, let's say, voted by too much and it created a perception of, let's say, waste. So I'm not sure if, if, I, if, I, if I made it a bit more confusing or clearer. So I'm sorry, I'm not sure if that was supposed to be, if that was just a, a comment on an activity that, that should happen or if that's a, a question for me. Um, I, I will say that I think last year's town meeting was a very different town meeting than usual. I think everything got approved in record time. I think people wanted to get in and out as fast as possible due to the situation. Um, and quite frankly, not <clears throat> attendance was very low last year. So I think last year was an exception, like getting a million dollars proved that quickly. I think last year was, was an exception. I think, you know, Bill brought up a point about the police cruiser. I think that, you know, in that particular instance, that did get voted down at town meeting. And I don't think there was enough data presented about that. Um, I don't think it was scrutinized enough. You, you know, I mean, I understand that the police have these cars and they're in them all the time, but these cars are far more reliable and we didn't look at any maintenance data or repair data on the cars before we replaced them and it got voted down. And then I said this before and I'm going to say it again at the fall town meeting when it, it appears to be fewer people there and not as scrutinized, it got slipped in in the past at that time. So I think that, you know, those are the types of situations that I'm thinking about. And, and, and I mean, people can argue with me all you want. I'm really going to stand by that. I felt that when I was at that town meeting, a fast one was pulled on me, to be quite honest with you. Understood. Thank you. Okay, does anyone have anything new to ask? Okay, if not, thank you, Shelby, for coming. I'm sure if Dan has any questions, yeah. he might reach out to you. Yeah, clarity. Dan, please do. If you have any questions or any recommendations, I would, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Sorry, I just realized that my screen was blank. I must have <laughs> hit, when I hit mute, I must have hit stop video. Yes, I'll, I'm going to, um, I'm as I'm writing mine up, I just want to make sure that I have everything correct so that when I present to the town, like Brian said, I just want to make sure it's as clear and concise as possible that I'm not misrepresenting anything. So I will 100% be reaching out to you. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shelby. Right. Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye. Okay, next next on the agenda is George. George. Hey, how you doing? Hey, George, how are you? Good. Okay, George, I think you have article six and seven. Okay. Uh, essentially, there are uh, two pieces of the same uh, puzzle here. Number six is actually an amendment to the town's bylaws. And, and for the folks at home that, that, that I don't know what we're talking about here, first of all, both these articles are dealing with revolving funds, which have to be set up in a legal fashion. And a revolving fund being something where the money comes in and the money goes out mostly without appropriation. So in the case of, of this particular, these two pieces, okay, what we've got going here is we are adding two new revolving funds to an already existing list. So even though number six looks like a whole bunch, what it is, is it's a reiteration of what was already there plus two more lines. So the two lines that we're adding in would be the ones for the fire department, which was the public health one that they're looking to do, funds for inoculations and reimbursement of the health service. The, the fire chief has been using a fund. He, he, he charges people for these various shots, not all of them being um, um, 
uh, for, uh, you know, like COVID. I mean, there was other things that they were doing with it. And then he was utilizing the money, okay, or wants to utilize the money to rebuy the materials needed so he can do up, set up another clinic, okay? The second one that we're adding is the IT technology for the school department. Essentially, bottom line on this one is that what, what we're doing here is the school, if, if you know, now all the, all the, the, the kids are on, um, they're getting iPads and, um, and uh, uh, Chromebooks and, and what have you to, to do home learning with. Um, the school has, like many others, been collecting um, a fee, okay, which would be, I, I'm not quite sure how much the fee is. I think it's between $25 to $50. So that in the event that there is a breakage, they have something to fall back on and get the machine fixed or, you know, buy an insurance policy or, or what have you. So the two new ones on Article 6 are those two, okay? So what's set up in, in Article 6, you now have the setup moving forward forever, okay, unless you come back and remove one. And you don't have to revisit that. You do, however, on every, uh, every year, which is standard procedure for these types of, um, of revolving funds. And when I say this, this is everywhere, not just, just here, so I don't want to make it sound. But when you have a revolving fund, you are essentially, each department that is using it is essentially being given the ability to spend sort of without appropriation at the town meeting because the money sort of flows in and the money sort of flows out. So what the state provides us as a sort of self-governing feature is that every year you, you, um, the town meeting will go in with these, okay, and say, well, here's the spending limit on it, all right? I mean, that's okay. If you want to go out and spend the money that you're doing on each one of these things, that's okay. But I don't want you spending any more than X, okay? So if you look, you'll see the, the spending limits, Mo most of them. Besides, the, I think they, they are, are, are similar to where they were last year. There, there might be a, a, a minor differential on one. Um, but uh, then you have your two new um, ones there, okay? The, the, again, the, 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 the fire one and the, um, and the, um, uh, the, the school um, IT technology piece. The only thing that did come up is I got a call from Paul this afternoon. And um, he was saying, well, why does it say uh, 21 and 22? And the reason for that is when we were going to, initially when we were going to set these up, they would like to spend the, these on these two new accounts, the money in 21. The school has some things that they want to spend this year, as does the fire chief. So initially, we had set this up for a special town meeting. The town council said, don't bother, put them all on one. Uh, you know, that way we, we don't have to have a double header here. I mean, and have like one open and close one and then start the other. So the fact that one says 21-22 is really targeting the two new ones to allow for the fact that those two did not exist last year, the others did. The others were voted and were given their, their um, you know, spending limits. The others were already existed in the bylaws. So by doing what we're doing here, we're, we're, the, the 21, 22 is recapturing for for the two new ones, since they did not have any spending limits set for 21, and also providing for the new year of 22, if that gives you what you need. George, so Article 6 is just to get the two new revolving funds in, and Article 7 is to allow them to spend uh, $100,000 each in this, in the year 2021. Yes, you, 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 yeah, yes, and and by the way, twenty twenty two also you're setting. Yes, spending, yeah, right, right, yes, right, right. Yes. But but the, right. They're, the reason they're separate is one is to actually incorporate the two new ones, and then seven is to allow them to spend a hundred right. this year and then right. hundred right. next. 
<laughs> Keep this in mind. I, you're not going to be seeing them actually spending that because the, the money, the, the, there isn't that much money in them. You know, it, it's more what the, 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 the spending cap is going to be more aimed for next year because I, there's nowhere near that kind of money in the, in, in, I know in the school one and I, I, I'm not sure on the on the on the fire chief's one, but the school one isn't even a quarter of that at this particular point in in, in 21. Hey George, yes. Hey Paul here. So thanks for your, your conversation um, at lunch today. I do have a question about the senior trip account. Yes. So I think that one went up a lot. I think when we did this last year, I think that was mine actually last year to present. It was 120, mm -hmm. um, and it's up to 250. So typically these accounts follow the revenue, right? So so the implication here is, is the revenue's way up or what's the implication of that? I, I believe, I believe in that the, the, the COA director, Mark, is anticipating if we, if we can ever get out of this um, quagmire here of this, the, the, this, this disease thing, that, that they're anticipating an increase in these trips moving forward. Yep. Again, now we remember when you said it. Okay, you, you're saying I'm going to allow you to go up to two hundred fifty thousand. Well, first of all, if there isn't two hundred fifty thousand in the account, yeah, it doesn't go. Okay, uh, so what it, it's basically saying is that, that we're allowing up to this. Okay, but then it's it's dictated, especially through. The accounting office, I don't know whether a lot of people realize that, but your last, and I hate to say it like this because it sounds like we're in a war or something, but I always say your last line of defense is the, the, the departments put their things in. It, it, when it finally hit their, their, their uh, request for expenditures, when it finally hits the accounting office, your town accountant is actually the person who will Say, hey, wait a minute! You, you you don't have that money in there. I can't allow this to, to go out, and that's where it finally stops. And by the way, our computer system also says, "Hold it! There's, there's only um, ten thousand dollars in here. You can't spend fifteen, okay?" So that's where it, it it finally hits, and and I don't think a lot of people realize that. So, but, so hey, oh sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was no, just going to no, say no, we have no. we have a note from Marie. Um, there is a plan to potentially put together a very large trip in the spring. And so that's yes. the explanation for the big increase. And again, just for, for totally to George's point, this is essentially a spending control to make right. sure you have an eye on an account where revenues are coming in. And so if that's if that's the explanation, that at least helps. Right. And, and that's, that's, exactly, be, that's exactly yeah. right, uh, George. If I, if I could just interject for one second, sure. uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, and just wanted to, Paul. The, 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 it's important to remember that this approval will be for July first through June thirtieth of next year. And uh, one thing that they uh, that that group did was uh, they had a rather large trip planned right, right before COVID that was supposed to go to Europe, and uh, they ended up canceling the whole thing. In fact, they got a, there was a lot of uh, concern about getting even uh, the return money back to people, which they ultimately did. But it's just um, it, it, it's just a case of they do anticipate a larger group of trips this upcoming year. So the answer to your question is effectively yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, if I could ask the police and fire revolving fund of 100,000, is that for the purpose of buying new vehicles, equipping them out? What, what's that, the goal of that money? No, no, the, the, um, the, well, the, 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 uh, the apparatus utilization revolving fund. Yes, they can, um, they can buy, uh, I, I believe, um, most of the time we're doing, um, capital, and buying the, the the cars and trucks with it, the revolving account, I believe. I'm, as I'm sitting here, I'm at a loss as to where the the, the money is 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 uh, coming in from. Either it's the the the, the sale of, of old vehicles or something. Well, well, it, I can I can answer that, George, if you want, because it, it's uh, this is a case where um, the town actually, when they do police details, they can actually rent the vehicle as well. Oh, and that money okay. goes into that account as well. And then also, if we have a situation where we have damage to a vehicle, we can put that that, that, that the, the insurance check into that account and then also purchase something else or, fair, or, or repair, help, to, help to pay for the repairs okay. for that account. 
that that makes sense. Yes. So okay. so um, I'm guessing part of this is is we're going to give these uh, parts of the town a certain amount of money to spend every year on their own. But if we're we're trying to give them a little leeway that 100 grand doesn't go far on an ambulance, a fire truck, or, or police car. So right, exactly. Right, exactly. But right. They, they do. They have to take. They have to take the money in somehow, John, and they. And they take the money and then, and then they can use it to uh, to repair something if something breaks um, without it really affecting the, the operating budget in many ways as well. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Most of your um, income, uh, when people bring in money, it goes to the general fund with the exception of your two uh, uh, enterprise funds. And then it is redistributed at the annual town meeting and people are making votes to say, you know, through the budget process, we're gonna spend all this money on this, 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 and this. But in certain instances, like these revolving accounts, they're allowing you to segregate this particular set of monies and not put it into the general fund, but put it into this account and then uh, utilize it without much, um, um, uh, you know, without the the, the the course of actually putting it out at a town meeting. If, if this gets approved, how will our reporting uh, update? So when, when we're here a year from now looking at stuff so we can tell you know, how much they have in this fund, how much they use, and whether when they're asking for money next year that we know what, what they already have kind of in the till in this, in this uh, program. Well, remember, all the, like I said, we're adding two new, okay? But there's, there's well, how many we got here? There, it looks like there was five of them already there before. At any particular point in time, if somebody was concerned about any of the any of these funds, like, well, how much came in, how much went out, we can pull off a, um, um, a, um, a sheet right off the computer that says, okay, here's where all the revenues came in. And, and by the way, here's what everything got spent all the way up, up to date. So you can see what, what, you know, what, what's going on with that. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, yeah, with regards to uh, the uh, police and fire uh, revolving, um, is there any uh, uh, preclusion against uh, or uh, reservation against uh, civil forfeiture assets going into that fund? Um, say, say again, what forfeitures? Is there any pro uh, prohibition against uh, civil forfeiture assets being put into that revolving account? Um, I, I mean, I, I guess, I guess what you're saying is, is if they took, if they took somebody's car, um, and, and you know, like in a drug raid or something like that, and then sold it, would it go in there? I, I believe they have another whole fund just for that. It, okay. it is a, and they, and it's, we, it, it's something that is set up from town to town. Okay. And it can be used for things that, police departments might need if they were doing undercover um, sort of things, uh, you know, uh, uh, if they, they needed money to, you know, like go out and purchase, like, you know, if I was an undercover guy trying to purchase drugs and things like that. Well, well as Bill said, you have to have a place for the money to go when it comes in, into the, into the yeah. right. And so yeah. uh, I don't remember seeing a line item. There, there, there is, a, I believe there is a drug, a drug forfeiture account yes. somehow. Yeah. It's, uh, yes. and it's, if you have a situation where like it's, it's drug related type of thing, they can put the money into that account. But um, I don't believe this account is intended for that purpose. They'll talk. Right. Right. I don't, it's segregated. I don't remember seeing that as a line item in the budget either. So I was, was no, 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 it would never be budget. That's what the finance department holds on to that. No, no, it's, it, it's in an account. It's not us, us having it. It's, it's segregated. This is money by law that can be segregated for an account for police use. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I wish I could keep it, but it doesn't. They don't. They don't let me. I'm sure, lawyers don't want you to keep it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Any any further questions on Article Six? Okay. Article Seven questions. Hey, George. I think you're good. Yes. You're good. Okay. Okay. Six and seven. Okay, that brings us to the uh, last item. Hey, Bill, are, are, are you still on? I'm still on. Yeah. Good. I, I, I have three questions I didn't want to clarify since I have you. Sure. Uh, I'm I'm trying to uh, set the schedule for next week. 
So yeah. the CIP budget article five, is that you or George gonna present to Adcom? So I can do uh, the agenda. I'll probably present it to you because it's my responsibility to present it. Okay. And then article 17, the uh, singular wireless on top of the uh, public safety. Yeah. So that's going to be. We'll, we'll probably, uh, myself and probably um, Mike Kelleher, Chief okay. Kelleher, will be involved in that because we. Uh, we what we collaborated on that on that particular issue. It's it's a pretty simple issue. It's not yeah. uh, doesn't, doesn't okay. it's not that I could probably do both myself. Okay. And then the last question is the uh, stretch energy code article twenty. Yeah, that's one. I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take that one because that's that requires an explanation. Um, either that'll either be Page or or Barry Ringler. Uh, the stretch energy code is is a require since the town is looking to try and become a green community. Yeah, we have we were required by law to adopt the stretch energy code in that case, and one of the few, and believe it or not, one of the few communities left in Massachusetts that has it is in the green community. Um, Bill, if, we, if if I'm not mistaken, this was uh, presented about, about eight or ten years ago, right? But it may have been. It may have been. I'm not. I'm not sure. I was. I wasn't here when it was, um, but it's entirely possible because green communities have been around for a long time, and um, I actually worked on one when I was in Dedham. <laughs> And uh, we actually were one of the first ones to become a green community at that time. But and that was probably about a good 10 years ago, a good 10, maybe, yeah. maybe 12 years ago. Yeah, if, if, I, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I'd say maybe 2012 was, it was presented to, to the mm -hmm. town meeting back then, but that could be a lot. Yeah. Things have changed a lot since then. And the stretch energy code is actually pretty commonly used um, by, by developers. I think a lot of the developers almost defer to that as, uh, as their basis for building nowadays. Okay. All right, I think I think I'm 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 good. Thank you. So, we, uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, just a, just a brief uh, note that we are um, tracking the uh, the federal legislation very closely. Yeah. Uh, to see, it did it did pass the House today, so we're waiting to see if the president will sign uh, probably by Friday, uh, and then we'll we're, we're we're trying to get a handle on how much it actually impacts Foxborough. Um, and we should know something by next week. Should they at least give you some indication of where that stands. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. Thank good night, you. everyone. You mean, do you need me for anything more, Mr. Chairman? Or you, no, I, I think we're good. Thanks, Bill. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, that brings us to the last item, which is the election of the uh, vice chair. I guess the, the I, I think I mentioned it. The the, the reason. Oh, a couple of reasons, but not, but not had to step down because of, of work really, you know, his work demands. So, so usually what we tend to do for the, uh, the position of the vice chair is to find someone that hopefully will we'll be back next year. So you can assume the, um, uh, the, the chair, the chair position. And, uh, usually, and so we have a smooth transition from, from this fiscal year into next. So that's that's one of that's that's re really the reason. And Bernard was, you know, given his his, his workload, he was willing. You know, I think he was. He, he told me, you know, I'm I'm willing to step down to let somebody step in, so we have a smooth transition. So that's the reason for it. So I know two people already um, mentioned an interest uh, in in running. So at this point, I'm going to ask for a, mo you know. Someone to nominate someone. So nominate Tom. Who did that? That's Brian. Oh, okay. Uh, any yeah. seconds? I'll accept it. <laughs> well, second. well, we're gonna ask for a second. <laughs> I can't second myself, right? Uh, I'll yeah. second. Okay. Any other nominations? Uh, yeah, I would like to nominate Paul. Okay. And second for Paul. I'll second that. I don't see that. I'm sorry. Who, who second it? All right. Oh, well, Jack or Sharon. I, I think I heard Jack. So, Jack, you got it. All right. So we're going to go. Um, those in favor. Well, since Tom was the first nomination, we'll go. Those in favor of Tom, raise your hand. I got one. I got two. You got three votes. Okay. Yeah, four. So it's uh, John Mahoney, Brian, and, and Tom. And, and you also have Dennis. Yeah, you also have Dennis. Yeah. Okay, that's four people. All right. So, and those in favor of Paul. Four. Don't tell me we have a tie. <laughs> Five, six. No, I'm sorry. One, two, three, four. 
Six plus whatever you are. Six. So, so, so congratulations, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. All set. All set. So, okay. all right. Um, before before we end before we end the meeting, I just want to uh, ask the committee. Um, next week we have right now three. I'm sorry, four articles to be presented to the committee. And my 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 question is. We do have time now. We are running short of time. So I'm gonna propose that we start deliberating the articles that was presented tonight. So I'm gonna put on an agenda and, 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 and the easy ones, if, if we can approve, we'll take the vote. The harder ones, if, if, if we need more time, that's fine. So at this point, I just wanna propose, propose that we do it. And then I also wanna take this uh, opportunity to thank uh, Bernard, Bernard, for helping us up over the years. Thank you, Bernard, and thank you for, for supporting me. Well, thank you to everyone. And then, yeah. by the way, regarding our, our process, uh, uh, I think I had mentioned to Larry that uh, at least I think uh, this is my uh, close to seventh year plus uh, in outcome. And, and I believe very much like the corporate world that no one should be indispensable. You actually, if someone stays too long for a function, one could argue that perhaps the process or the institution itself, uh, you know, doesn't work as well as it should. So um, it just so happened that um, uh, from a work standpoint, actually um, things are going uh, very bright for me. So uh, it's just also added work. And uh, like everything else in life, I had to, talking about the balancing act, I had to, to juggle. And given seven plus year in outcome and, I think that it was probably perhaps the right time to do this transition. So, um, so Larry was correct. Hey, Bernard, I think what you've done is amazing. And as I said in the email, we will get together for a beer or something um, before you're done. But um, I'm going to be bothering you a lot for the next three months. So thank you in advance for that. No, it's, 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 it would be my pleasure. OK. Do we? Does anybody have anything you want to discuss? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Hey, Larry, uh, just real quick. Um, yeah. Provided that there are edits to the article, how does that process work for our vote next week? Um, actually, I don't know, Brian. I think I think if any edits, <laughs> you stopped me. How's that? I, Sorry. I, I think I, the best I, way I'm just... I'm just curious, like, for example, it seems to me Article 26 is going to need some edits, right? Um, and I'm wondering if that means that we are no longer able to vote for it if Correct. it gets modified. Okay. Correct. If, if, okay. At some point, we would, if, would we have to vote again if there no, are amendments I, made to it? I would prefer not to. I mean, if, if then, if, if you find out from her or if I hear that she's going to make any, any edits, whatever it is, then we should hold off. I think okay. it's it's no point voting on it. So my 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 position is that if, if we know she's gonna change whatever or not, if she's not gonna change, we'll deliberate. But if she's gonna change, we should give her the, the time. We have time to, to to make whatever changes she wants okay. be, before we do it. So uh, if uh, another okay. dimension, we may choose to propose amendments. We can do that too. Yeah. Yes. Agree. 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 So I, I think what, what, what I'll do is we'll put, we'll put all the articles on the agenda to, to, to deliver it. And then if I hear from now to, and until next week from her, if she's gonna make any changes, I'll, we'll bring it to the table. And if anybody wants to make any, any proposal to change, we can do that. You're right, Jack. Okay, anything else? Thank you. Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn then? Motion to adjourn. All right, second, Jack. So in favor, we'll raise your hand, I'll, I can see. Hey, Tom, are you? Motion to adjourn, Brian, do you wanna raise your hand if you are? I got it up. Okay, so everyone voted yes. Good night, talk to you guys Good later. Night. Good night. <laughs>